Well, uh, it is an honor to speak uh, with any statewide forum, but especially um, to be asked to speak about global health at one of the world's most respected institutes that works in global health is a particular honor, so thank you for allowing me to be here. I am going to speak this morning about the mingled destinies of global and domestic public health, and that title was chosen very specifically to say that this is more than just a relationship. All right, this is really a mingled destiny. What happens in one place affects the other, and so on. Um, that's me. And what I'm going to do today, in the time that we have together, is I'm going to engage you in a dialogue to help answer a single question. All right? And by answering this question, hopefully we'll have a better understanding of this intermingled relationship between domestic and global public health. And the question that you're going to be asked, that we're going to talk about together, is what is the greatest challenge in global health? Okay? And I'm going to interact with you uh, to answer this question. And um, hopefully by doing that, we're going to accomplish three things. One, we'll be able to review the interrelationship of global and domestic public health. Secondly, we'll be able to discuss why it remains essential for those of us in Tennessee to be involved in global health. And for those of you that are new to the profession, that are new to public health and global health, we're going to provide you with four good answers and one great answer to a simple but remarkably challenging question. All of you who work in global health and have done so for a while have been asked this question many times. Those of you that are new to the profession will be asked this question, and it's essential that you have a good answer to it, because this question appears to be very simple, but is in fact quite complicated. And this simple but remarkably challenging question, and everyone's going to nod their head saying, yes, they get asked it at least once a month, is when there are so many health challenges here in our country, why do you spend so much time and effort working overseas? All right, Every one of us gets asked this question. And it, it can change why the, when there's so many health challenges here in Tennessee or so many health challenges here in Appalachia. Now, to those of you that are new to this, this seems like a pretty simple and innocent question. And oftentimes, people who ask this of you are asking it genuinely to get an answer. But sometimes there is an agenda behind this question. And you need to understand what that agenda is in order to understand why it's so important to have a good answer. And that agenda is, instead of why do you spend so much time, it's why do you waste so much money working with undeserving people? And when you understand that that is sometimes the agenda behind this question, you understand why it's so important to have four good answers, or at least one good answer, and one great answer to the question. Okay, so I said I was going to engage you in a conversation about this question. What is the greatest challenge in global health? I know all of you are waiting to see if I fall off the edge of the stage. I told Dr. Stutz if that happened, I'd be on YouTube, which, you know, any publicity is good publicity. <laughs> and when you're in the same state with Vanderbilt, you need all the publicity you can get if you're at East Tennessee State University. All right, so how are we going to engage in a dialogue? The way we're going to do it is with these clickers, right? Did each of you get a clicker? Ah, we'll hand them out now. While they're handing them out, I will tell you that they have no intrinsic value. You can't use them when you leave this room. So please return them to us when you're done today. They actually belong to ETSU. If I don't bring them back, I probably have to make more. All right, in the process of this, what we're going to do is, throughout this talk this morning, I'm going to ask you to register your vote with this little clicker, and you'll get it in a second. And what you'll do is there'll be some choices up there, and you'll press the right number with your thumb or your forefinger. I prefer the thumb. Some of you will prefer the forefinger. All right. This is called killing time while they hand out the clickers. Okay, <clears throat> we're getting close to the front. All right, so just for a starting point, just to make sure that these actually work and you understand how to do it, you're going to give me a little bit of information about yourself. Okay, this is just a test of the clicker system. In the event of a real clicker, you'd be instructed where to tune in your area. 
All right. You're going to press 1. Not yet, please. You're going to press 1 if you're from the greater Nashville area. Press 2 if you're from another area in Tennessee. Press 3 if you're some, from somewhere else in the United States. And by the way, I, I understand that everyone is from multiple places. We are born one place. We live somewhere else. If your colleague said to you, where are you from, you'll press one, if you're from the greater Nashville area, and greater simply refers to geographic, not quality. You're from another area in Tennessee, you'll press two. From somewhere else in the U.S., you'll press three. From another country, you'll press four. And if you're brought here by the alien mothership, you'll press five. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? The way you do it is you're going to, not yet, you're going to hold in the button with your thumb or forefinger. I prefer the thumb. A light will come on. You hold it in until the light goes off and your vote is registered. If you've made a mistake, you vote again, okay? Just like Chicago. <laughs> the only difference is only the last thing you vote counts, okay? So here we go. The voting is now open. You can see we're getting votes in. We've had 45, 48, 57. I have to register. I'm from other Tennessee. 73, 76, 77. Can you see all that up there? Okay, 78. Anybody else want to vote? Everyone happy with their vote? All right, here we go. All right, so 46% of you from the greater Nashville area, 10% from other parts, in the, uh, other parts of Tennessee. 23% of you are from the United States, 15%. 6% are from the alien mothership, which is really good, because you know, when I came in, I thought I recognized some faces. <laughs> okay. All righty, so how are we going to do this interactive thing on what is the greatest challenge in global health? The first thing we have to understand is to take a step back and actually ask ourselves what this question is. Because typically, when you present this question to people from the United States, they see this question as, what is the greatest challenge facing the rest of the world? All right? There's an alternate view which is what is the greatest challenge facing the entire world, right? So just to make sure that all of us understand the importance of that distinction, we're going to talk a little bit about the health status of the United States just to set this in context, right? And we're going to talk about life expectancy and infant mortality. For you, I'm not going to explain what life expectancy is. You know this, how long a baby born today is projected to live. It's the basic, most fundamental measure of health. And if we went out on the streets of Nashville and we asked the man on the street to tell us two things about life expectancy, in the United States, he would tell us two things, right? He'd tell us, first of all, that life expectancy in the United States is probably the longest that it has ever been. And here the man on the street would be right. In 2008, life expectancy in our country was 78.1 years. It's the longest it's ever been. In the course of the 20th century, we saw a phenomenal increase in life expectancy in the United States of over 30 years. Think about that. From the time my grandparents were born, to the time my youngest child was born, life expectancy went up by three decades. That's really phenomenal. And most of it, of course, in the first half of the 20th century, before most of the, most, the modern medical advances that we think about. All right? So the second thing the man on the street is going to tell us is that life expectancy in the United States is probably the longest in the world. He knows we're one of the wealthiest nations that has ever existed in the history of mankind. He knows we have access to healthcare infrastructure unlike that anywhere in the world. He knows we have one of the world's best training programs for physicians and health professionals. But is the man on the street right? So now you can register your vote. Don't vote yet. Where do you think the US is ranked in the world for life expectancy? You'll press one if you think we're in the top five, two if it's six to 10, three if it's 11 to 15, four if it's 16 to 20, or five if you think it's worse than 20. OK, you ready? And the polling is now open. You can vote again. This is also a way I can tell how many people are falling asleep while we're talking. If that number goes down from 78. Oh, I voted last time. Yeah. I know the answer. That's not really fair, is it? OK, well, I'm sure you all know the answer, too. We're going to pull polling. OK, so a third of you think we're in the top, well, about half of you think we're in the top 10. And about a tenth of you think we're in the bottom 20. The man on the street says, we're here. Statistics say that we trail all of these countries. And there are about three dozen countries that do better at this basic measure of health than does the United States. Three dozen countries where a baby born today is projected to live a longer life than does a baby born in the United States. 
three dozen countries that do better at this basic fundamental measure of health than does the United States. As worrisome as that is, here's all 50 states from Hawaii at the longest to Mississippi at the shortest life expectancy. To save you reading the whole list, there's Tennessee down there with a rate that is fully six years less than the lowest rate achieved by another state. If we were to compare Tennessee to other countries in the world, which we can't do, we'd fall somewhere around here. You can't do it because these numbers come from different sources. But even if you add one year or two years to our life expectancy, you find ourselves being compared to countries that we hardly think of ourselves being compared to. So at least from the standpoint of life expectancy, we have an understanding that perhaps this isn't really a we and they kind of phenomenon, is it? What about infant mortality, the chance of a baby making it to their first birthday? Again, a very exquisite measure of health, the health of two vulnerable populations, young women and children, a very sensitive statistic that measures a socioeconomic status and extremely sensitive to disruptions in the social infrastructure through civil war, mass migration, and so on. And if we went out on the streets and asked the woman of the street of Nashville where infant mortality rate is today, she'd tell us two things, right? She'd tell us, first of all, that infant mortality in the U.S. is probably the lowest it's ever been. And here she'd be more or less right uh, I say more or less because it's really been stable for a number of years now. But we saw a phenomenal increase in the course of the 20th century. From the time my grandparents were born, there was a 1 in 10 chance of dying before their first birthday. It's now to, down to 6.3 per 1,000. That means for every 1,000 babies born alive, 994 of them are going to make it to their first birthday. The second thing the woman on the street is going to tell us is that infant mortality in the United States is probably the lowest in the world. She knows that we're one of the wealthiest countries that has ever existed. She knows that we have a health care infrastructure unlike that anywhere else in the world. She knows that we care deeply about women and children in our country. And the question is, would the woman on the street be right? And so now you can vote again, not yet. You're going to vote one if you think we're in the top five, two if we're six to ten. I'm opening it up a little bit, three if it's 11 to 20, four if you think we're 21 to 30th, or five if you think we're worse than 30th. Okay, polling is now open. You can vote again. <coughs> Nothing worse than someone coughs while they're talking, right? 81. This isn't Louisiana, guys. Come on, you can only have so many. Okay, so I used to live in Louisiana. I can make jokes about the politics there. Okay, so what is, what's the real answer here? All right, so. A quarter of you think we're worse than 30th, three quarters think we're better. Well, the real answer is in 2008, the United States ranked behind all of these countries and came in about 35th. In other words, again, three dozen countries that do better at this basic fundamental measure of health than does our country. Three dozen countries where a baby born today has a better chance of making it to his or her first birthday than a baby born in the United States. If you look at all 50 states from Utah at the lowest to Mississippi, at the highest there's Tennessee with a rate that's almost double the lowest rate achieved by another state. If you were to compare us to other countries, which you can't really do, we'd fall somewhere in this range. But even if you reduced it by one or two, you find ourselves being compared to countries that we normally don't compare ourselves to. All of that was a long-winded way of my saying that when we ask this question, greatest challenge in global health, we're talking about everybody. Right? This is not a we and they phenomenon. The United States is not in a position to say, well, what's the greatest challenge for everybody else? All right, there's dozens of countries that do better at the basic measures of health than do we in the United States. So this question that we're asking, what is the greatest challenge in global health? What's the challenge, the greatest challenge that all 7 billion people in the world today face? All 194 plus countries. What's the greatest challenge that we face? Now, obviously, we can't dialogue from, from a, a zero starting point, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present 10 things that I think reasonably represent what might be the greatest challenge in global health. I'll ask you to think about them, tell me which ones you think are most important, and then we'll go from there, okay? So the 10 items I'm going to present for your consideration are deaths of children under five. We've already heard some of those statistics. Depression and mental health, environmental destruction, epidemic diseases like AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, and by the way, you'll notice that these 10 are presented in no particular order except alphabetical. Human violence and war, lack of safe food and water, overpopulation, tobacco, unequal access to resources, and the so-called Western diseases. All right. 
So I'm going to ask you to look at that list, and I'm going to ask you to pick the top three things that you think are, would reasonably be in your top three list. And the way you're going to do it is you'll press your button down with your thumb or your forefinger, and I prefer. That's right. See, you said they couldn't learn anything, Doug. OK, sorry. All right. You'll hold it down till the light comes on, goes off, then you press down the second one, then you press down the third one. Okay? Each case, let the light come on and go off. If you want to vote for number 10, you can press 0. If you make a mistake, the machine will register your last three votes. So if you want to vote 1, 2, 3, but you put 2, 3, 4, well, never mind. Just, if you make a mistake, start again from the beginning. Okay? All right. So think about it. Don't vote yet. Which three do you think are the most important? And when I give the signal, and not before, press your top three. This is designed for a younger demographic. I have to be very explicit about when they can vote. Don't vote yet. All right, pick your top three. OK, and polling is now open. It'll take a few seconds to do this. Now, it registers, if, even if you just vote for one thing, so please make sure you vote for three. 81, 82. Oh, people are coming in. That's why. Hi. Good. That's okay. We'll drive them off. 87. Wow. Okay, everyone ready? Everyone completed? Unfortunately, I can't have you vote. All right, here we go. So what do you think are the greatest challenge in global health? Okay. So about a quarter of you say death of children under five, eight percent say depression and mental health, about one in five say environmental destruction, 37 say epidemic diseases like HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, about a third say human violence and war, two-thirds of you say the access to safe food and water, six percent say overpopulation, nine percent say tobacco, 51 percent say unequal access to resources, and 10 percent say Western diseases. OK. We'll be able to come back to this at the end. And as you figured out, there's no right or wrong answer here. This is really an engagement. Okay? I'm going to now go through each of these 10, tell you why I put them on the list, and then we can vote again at the end and see if anyone's opinions have changed at all. All right, well, death of children under five. Obviously, there's something about children that connects with all of us. We can't look at pictures or images of kids and not feel some particular connection with them. This year, more than 8 million children will die under the age of 5. To give you some context, that's the same as losing the entire population of Tennessee every nine months. Perhaps more relevant, it's the same as losing between a third and a half of the young kids in the United States every year. Imagine the tragedy, the devastation we would feel if one-third to one-half of our under-fives in this country died in a single year, and yet that's who's dying around the world. About 1,000 children die every hour. I once sat down and figured out that all the kids in this picture would be dead in about six minutes. Put another way, in the time it takes to read this sentence aloud, another child in the world has died. Now, that obviously is a tremendous tragedy. But what makes the tragedy even worse is the realization that the majority of these deaths are not because these children have diseases that can't be prevented or cured, but because these children have diseases that are not being prevented and cured. All right? About one in five of these kids die from pneumonia. In most parts of the world, pneumonia can be treated with antibiotics that cost less than a dollar. About the same number of kids die from diarrheal disease, which can be generally prevented with safe food and water and can be treated with oral rehydration. About half that many die from malaria. And we know we can reduce death from malaria with bed nets, residual spraying, treatment, reduction of breeding places. Measles, of course, a vaccine-preventable disease. About half of them would be prevented with vaccine. And the list goes on and on. And even this large group here, newborn complications, when you look at it, you realize that many of them are things that could be prevented. So here we have this situation where we're losing 8 million kids a year, most of them between a half and two-thirds at least, are dying not because they have diseases that can't be prevented or cured, but they're dying because we, they have diseases that we 
have not prevented or cured. And that's why death of children under five is on the list. Not many of you picked depression or mental health. But the truth is it has a tremendous impact on health. Roughly 120 million people in the world suffer from depression. Almost a million people kill themselves every year. It has been estimated that unipolar major depression is the leading cause of disability loss, life lost in the world. And of course, depression affects physical health, the welfare of the family, risk of substance abuse, and so on. Think about it. In our country, if someone has depression and they have to miss some time from work, they can usually go back to work, get their job, start working again. But what happens in a place in the world where people, where that family lives on the money that they make that day? If someone can't work, they don't eat. So depression has a major impact, not only on the health of individuals, but the health of families and communities. And that's why it's on our top 10 list. Environmental destruction, uh, relatively few of you picked this out. Um, but the realization is that we are living at a time when we are changing the world that we live in. We're losing forests at a rate of about 144 square miles a day. That's the size of Tennessee every 10 months being lost. Three million people are dying from outdoor air pollution and one and a half million from indoor air pollution, largely from biomass cooking, indoor cooking, and so on. Depending on how you define environmental disease, as many as a third of children die from an environmental exposure between water, air, and so on. Preventing environmental risks could save as many as four million children a year. Now, we understand that talking about environmental change is sometimes seen as a political issue. Okay? I'm not a political person. I will tell you simply that if you look out your window, you will see a world that is dramatically different from the world your grandparents saw. Right? There is no doubt that we are changing the world. Whether we choose to call it global warming or whether that's due to human activity or not doesn't really matter. The environment is changing. And the things we don't know is how much change in the environment is consistent with human life. And here I'm not talking about catastrophic death, but I'm talking about what's going to happen if temperatures do go up and we reintroduce vector-borne diseases in places where they've been eliminated. What happens if weather patterns do change in the agricultural regions of countries are no longer as productive as they were before. The truth is we don't know how much change is consistent with human life, and perhaps most worrisomely, we don't know what the early warning signs would be that we're approaching that point. Okay? And that's why environmental destruction is on the list. You all, many of you picked epidemic diseases, and appropriately so. That's what many people think of when they think of global health. We all know that HIV is a disease that was completely unknown before 1980. And now over 30 million people in the world believed to be infected, over 20 million deaths. Some have estimated 10 million or more orphans in sub-Saharan Africa. There are countries in Africa where up to a fifth of adults, young adults, are infected with HIV. We know that there are drugs that are effective in treating it, but only about half of the people in sub-Saharan Africa who need those medications are getting access to them. And that's why AIDS belongs on the list. Tuberculosis is a disease that many people in the United States don't think much about. When I went to medical school, it was basically taught as a historical interest. But the truth is, 100 years ago, it was the leading cause of death in our country. Okay? Even today, between one and one and a half million people in the world die from tuberculosis. About 75 to 80 percent of them could be prevented, the deaths could be prevented with existing low-cost medications. It's been estimated that one person becomes infected with TB every second. Not everyone who gets exposed gets sick, but those who do will expose 10 to 15 more people before they themselves die. And that's why tuberculosis is on the list. Malaria, of course, kills about a half a million people a year, mostly kids under five and pregnant women. We've already talked about the fact that it is easily preventable and treatable. Many of you in this room, myself included, had malaria as kids. We survived because we had access to health care and other factors. But that's why epidemic diseases are on the list. Human violence and war is something we often don't think about in terms of global health. But the impact is pretty dramatic. We are almost unique among species in our ability and willingness to kill each other in large numbers. 
There are plenty of animal species that will kill each other on an individual basis. A lion will kill another lion for the pride. Chimpanzees will kill another chimp who wanders into their territory. But there aren't many species that can engage in the wholesale attack on each other. And in the 20th century, almost 200 million people lost their lives directly or indirectly as a result of conflict. At least half of them were civilians. One and a half million people die as a result of violence. And many, many more physically, psychologically, or emotionally injured. If you add to this issues like child abuse, human trafficking, and so on, you realize that human violence and war belongs on our list. Lack of safe food and water was your number one choice. 65% of you put that on your top three list. All right. In our country today, we almost don't think about water anymore. Water really has become an issue of art. It's what do we want our bathrooms to look like. But of course, water remains an extremely important issue around the world. A billion people in the world don't have clean drinking water. Two and a half billion people don't have access to a toilet and they defecate in the open. This is not an issue of aesthetics. This is an issue of public health. A study was done that shows that by adding a flush toilet, you can increase by 60% the chance of a child reaching his first birthday. Sorry, I forgot to put that up. Each year, 2 million people die from diarrheal diseases associated with water. And so water clearly belongs on our list. Food is a part of human culture. It's not only essential for life, it's often how we define who we are by what we eat and yet dozens of countries don't produce enough food to feed their people. Over almost a billion people in the world are now malnourished, including about 150 million under the age of five. That's about half the population of the United States, to give you some context. Half of all deaths of five are associated with malnutrition. I should have mentioned that before. And it affects both physical and intellectual growth. I once had a professor who said to me, if all malnutrition did was produce small people, That'd be okay because small people don't eat that much. I have five kids, they eat a lot. But it also impacts intellectual growth. It reduces creativity, uh, problem solving, and so on. So that's why malnutrition is on the list and it contributes to 25,000 deaths, mostly kids, every day. Overpopulation is sort of the granddaddy of them all. <clears throat> the world's population is growing really fast. And of all the things I tell you today, this is probably the one you'll remember, because this is the one thing that sticks in my mind. I once sat down and figured out that from the time my grandparents were born, the world's population has quadrupled. Four times as many people on the planet today as when my grandparents were born. From the time my father was born, and he is still living, the world's population has tripled. Three times as many people on the planet as when my dad was born. In my lifetime, and I am still living, the world's population has doubled. Think about that for a second. That is a stunning concept to think about. The world's oldest living person is someone named Bess Brown Cooper was born right here in Tennessee, 115 years of age, a graduate of East Tennessee State University. <laughs> Think about it. In her lifetime, in the lifetime of a living person, the world's population has quadrupled. And it may rise to 9 to 10 billion by the middle of this century. If you take the number of people added, born every day, and you subtract the number that die, the net gain is 200,000 people a day. To give you some sense, that would be the same as adding the entire population of Tennessee to the world every month. Month after month after month. Half the world's population is under the age of 25. There's, there's two subpopulations within that. The young kids 
who require nurturing and support, care, compassion. And then the older group, the 18, 17, 15 to 25, that have dreams for the world, things they want to accomplish, ambitions, goals, aggression, things that they want to create a family for themselves. But think about this, and some of you are in that age demographic, right? How do you achieve your life goals if you're part of half the world's population that, spend, that has less to spend each day than most of us spent on a cup of coffee this morning? And how do you achieve your life goals and ambitions if you're part of the one billion people who live on less than a dollar a day? Right? We're adding people at an incredible rate. And the one thing <clears throat> we don't know is how many people the Earth can support. And here I'm not talking about a Malthusian collapse or anything like that. But think about it. The more people that are here, the more people that are living in these mega cities, 10, 20 million people, at what point does that accumulation of mankind increase the risk of communicable disease, interpersonal violence? At what point does that many people living away from the agricultural regions make them vulnerable to environmental changes in those regions? And at what point does that many people living in one place, relying on the transportation of food from other places, become vulnerable to changes in infrastructure, cost of gas, and so on? So the one thing we don't know is how many people the Earth can support before we start to see some of this deterioration. And we don't know, of course, what the early warning signs would be that we're approaching that point. And that's why overpopulation is on the list. Tobacco, some of you think it's odd to have tobacco separate, but of course five million people die from tobacco every year. That's more than AIDS, illegal drugs, murder, suicide, and motor vehicle accidents combined. It's been estimated that there will be one billion deaths from tobacco in the 21st century. Most of them, again, at, this, at least half of them in this productive age group, the same age population that's being devastated by HIV, all up in smoke. It's estimated that of people alive today, 500 million will die from tobacco. And here's a statistic for you. 10 million cigarettes are sold every year. I mean every month, every week, every day, every hour. 10 million cigarettes are sold every minute. And that's why tobacco is on our list. Unequal access to resources. Some of you aren't even sure what we mean by that. We talk about poverty, disparities, inequity, resource gap, inequality. We talk about the third world, impoverished nations, developing countries. The bottom line is, as I said before, there are people dying not because they have diseases that we don't know how to prevent or cure, but because we're not doing it. We already said half of children could, at least half of children could be saved with existing low-cost interventions. We already mentioned that half of people with AIDS in Africa don't receive needed antiretrovirals. We already talked about the fact that three-quarters to 80 percent of people with tuberculosis could be cured with existing medications, half a million. The bottom line is there's this direct correlation, both because of what we do and don't do and because of the impact of poverty. There's a direct correlation between poverty and health. And probably nowhere is that clearer than in this chart from Hans Rosling, the World Development Chart in 2004. Many of you have seen this chart. Those of you that haven't now have. Across the bottom is income, okay, with wealth over here, poverty over here, gross national income per capita. On this side is health, death of children under five. Less healthy down here, more healthy up there. Each dot is a country. The size of the dot is the population of the country. There's China, there's India, there's the United States. The color of the dot is the continent that the country is on. And in 2004, the poorest country in the world at that time was Sierra Leone that had an under five mortality of 300. That means for every thousand babies born alive, 300 would be dead by their fifth birthday. At the same time, the healthiest country in the world was Sweden, with an under five mortality of about three. In other words, a hundredfold difference in the chance of a baby dying before their fifth birthday, defined by this relationship between poverty and health. 
And this isn't just an international phenomenon. This exists in the United States as well. If you look at the chance of dying before the age of 65 by income categories, and in this case, I have the rich, wealthy over here. Normally, we put the wealthy on the right and poverty on the left. It's a little political joke there. <laughs> All right, you hold the relative risk for this group of dying before the age of 65 at one. For poor Americans, it's three and a half, three times. A poor American is three times more likely to die before the age of 65 than a rich American. And this disparity exists not just for death, but for almost all the major diseases and so on. And for those of you that aren't aware, the gap between rich and poor in our country is widening and not narrowing. The bottom line is there's a direct correlation between resources or poverty and health. And that's why it's on the list. And finally, Western diseases. Uh, all of you know that two-thirds of us in this room, two-thirds of Americans will die from one of these five causes, right? Heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and injury. And I did look down before I said that. All right. Two-thirds of us, barring unforeseen circumstance, will die of one of those five causes. It is surprising to people to learn that these are also the leading causes of death around the world. Indeed, the leading cause of death is cardiovascular disease, accounting for about a third of deaths, 80% of them taking place in low- and middle-income countries. And today, for the first time, the number of overweight individuals in the world rivals the number that are underweight. There are many things about Western culture to emulate and be proud of, but some of our behavioral factors probably are not among them. Okay, so I've gone through this top 10 list. You might reasonably ask, why didn't I include aging? Clearly a major global health problem. Cultural loss, corruption and greed, emerging infectious diseases, extremist violence, gender inequalities, international debt, lack of education, motor vehicle accidents of the unknown. Why didn't I include them? Or we probably could sit here and come up with another 10 reasonable things. I just had to pick 10, so I picked the 10 that I did, recognizing that all of those could make a case for being the greatest challenge in global health. Okay, so now we're going to vote again. Back to your top three. Don't vote yet. Same thing as before. Okay. And here we go. You can vote again. Oh, wow. 97. 102, 104. How many people have two clickers? Be honest. Okay, good. 104, all in, all done? Okay. All right, so now we have a third for death of children, 6% depression. I'm going to try to toggle back and forth between the pre and post just to see if I've happened to change anybody's vote. It doesn't look like things changed very much which essentially means you're ignoring me. All right, so before we had, number one was food and water at 65%, and the lowest was overpopulation at 6%. Now we're overpopulation has driven, risen to 23%, which is sort of in keeping with that. Lowest is depression. Okay. And these are available for review afterwards. Now, in fairness, <clears throat> I have to tell you what my top three would be. <laughs> you really can't stop me anyway. <laughs> but my number three is environmental destruction. These are the three things I worry about the most. There's a reason why we call it Mother Earth. There's a reason why almost every primitive tribe worships the Earth. We are probably the only species that knowingly bespoils its nest. And as I said before, we simply don't know how much change, whether it's global warming or anything else, we simply don't know how much change is consistent with human life and the point at which we will begin to see changes in our health status. And what worries me most about this is, as all of you understand, these changes, these trajectories, are not things that change on a dime. Whatever's going to happen in the next 5, 10, 15 years is probably already destined to happen. And that's why I put environmental destruction number three on my list. Number two on my list is one that hardly ranked any votes at all in the beginning. 
and that's overpopulation. All of you understand the concept of a petri dish, right? You put bacteria on it and it grows until all the nutrients are done and then it stops growing. I don't think that's the exact model for humans, but I am worried about this continued growth because I don't know the point at which our clustering, our urbanization, our reduction in available agriculture, our isolation of agriculture from population centers, when all of those things are going to form a perfect storm and we will no longer have the ability to sustain the kind of numbers that we have today. And that's why I'm particularly concerned about overpopulation and as again, this idea that whatever is going to happen is sort of destined to happen. All right, we've got 650 million people in the world under the age of five already. For the next 10 years or so, they will be dependent on us to take care of them. So what do I list? All right, no, I already said that. Number one, for me, the number one challenge in global health, in my opinion, is not what you picked as number one. I love PowerPoint. Unequal access to resources. To me, that is the greatest challenge that we face in global health. And why do I say that? I say it for three reasons. One, it is fundamentally wrong. I'm not embarrassed to stand in front of you and say, I think this is wrong. Okay? I realize that sounds a bit Pollyannish. But we are in a situation where there are literally millions of people dying because they don't have access to things that we take for granted. All right? Engage in this mind game for a second. Imagine all of you on this side of the room have a disease. I'm sorry. All of you on this side of the room have the cure, but you don't. And instead of you, say it's your children and you have the cure, and you don't. And that's essentially the model that we have in the world today. We have literally millions of people dying. I'm not talking about a college education for everyone. I'm not talking about an automobile for everyone. I'm talking about the basic ability to keep people alive. And I'm not embarrassed to say that I think it's fundamentally wrong. The second reason I put it on my list is it is something that we can address immediately. A lot of problems on that list are things that take a long time to address. But think about this. In the 1980s, Rotary International engaged in something called Polio Plus. Many of you know about that. Since that time, clinical polio has been reduced by 99.5% in the world. Six years ago, 15, one five, 15 percent of people in sub-Saharan Africa who needed antiretroviral drugs were getting them. Today, because of the work of the Gates Foundation, Clinton Foundation, Global Fund, and others, 50%, right? Now, granted, Rotary and Gates and Clinton and Global Fund have a lot of money, more than you and I do. If you have that kind of money, I would like to talk to you. But the money they have is negligible compared to what we have as nations. Right? These are problems that can be solved. The moment we throw our hands up and say these are problems that can't be solved, we've lost the game. These are problems that can be addressed. Not all of them, but many of them can be. And the third reason I put unequal access to resources on my list is because the consequences of ignoring it are simply too great. Literally millions of people are dying. But I want you to play another mind game with me. As you probably figured out, I think a lot about the past. I talk about the time my grandparents lived and what life was like back then. And I often go back even farther. And I often say, gee, how did they live at a time when there were public executions and public torture? Or how did they live at a time when we allowed the enslavement of other people? We look back and we judge our ancestors harshly. Ask yourself this question. What will our great-great-grandchildren say about us? Well, they say you lived at a time when a million people died from tuberculosis and you had drugs that could save their life that cost less than $40. 19% of deaths under kids, pneumonia for a buck. How will people, never before in human history has this situation existed. 
where there's been such a disparity between those who have and those who have not. The consequences of ignoring this are really too great. I said at the beginning I was going to do three things. You may say I haven't done any of them. To review the interrelationship of global and domestic public health, why it remains essential, and the four good answers and one great answer. I'll put to you that I've actually done all three. I'll simply ask you this question. Which item on that list is global and which is domestic? There is no difference. I defy you to find any item up there other than perhaps malaria, which isn't a domestic issue as well as a global issue. So what about these four good answers and one great answer? I'll give you the answers. Right? A good answer, the question for those of you who came in late, was when there's so many health problems here in the United States, why do you work overseas? Right, that's the question. A good answer, most of the conditions we study abroad are the same ones that affect us here. What we learn overseas helps us here. That's a good answer. You can use that anytime with virtually anybody. Second answer, even those things that don't exist here, with the speed and extent of international travel, they can be here literally overnight. So a disease that might exist in sub-Saharan Africa only today could be here tomorrow. A third good answer is that some of the diseases and conditions that we study abroad have a prevalence overseas that they really have to be studied there. If we want to study maternal child transmission of HIV, we need to go where that is more common. And the fourth good answer is by preventing disease and death in other countries, we reduce threats to our own health. If a disease is there and it could be here, by blocking it there, we're reducing it here and protecting our own economic stability because inevitably we do respond to global disasters when they occur. Those are four good answers, any one of which you could give to someone who asks you that question. But what about the one great answer? Interestingly, this is the right answer, but it's one that I almost never use. Why do you study overseas? Why do we work globally? Because the destiny of all the world's people are inexorably intermingled. In every way you can name, the consequences of not working abroad is against our own best interest. We've already talked about morally. There's not a single moral or religious paradigm that I'm aware of that says it's okay for you to die from something that they have. Economically, we've already talked about the cost, the fact that HIV AIDS has already been identified as a threat to global security. Diplom diplomatically, Tennessee's Senator Bill Frist has been very eloquent in articulating the role that global health plays in world peace. Medically, obviously, if there's a disease overseas and it can appear here, it's in our best interest to stop it there. And socially, if a disease or situation is going to cause social disruption, mass migration of people, immigration, and so on, in every way you can imagine, the destiny of the world's people are inexorably intermingled. And the consequences of ignoring it are simply too great. Time for me to say goodbye to you, for you to say goodbye to me, and for you to line up and weigh in with any questions or comments that you may have. Let me close by thanking you for your attention, not to what I've said today, but to the issue of global health. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. If they're easy questions, I'll answer them myself. If they're hard, I'll refer them to Vanderbilt. The gender inequality, it, it seems as if so much of the problems in the developing world are a result of gender inequality, whether it's the whole situation with HIV AIDS or overpopulation. Education. And I wondered if you could comment a little bit more, further on why you, I'm not saying you minimized it, yeah. but why it didn't uh, reach the, uh, the strength that some of us would have liked. Thank you. No, it's, it's a good, the, and the question is why, why was gender inequality not on the list? And you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there's abundant studies that show that addressing women's educational issues is a major step forward in, 
in, in development in any country. Uh, gender inequality and empower gender equality and empowerment uh, is is beneficial from birth control areas, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, and so on. Probably the reason that it doesn't appear in my top ten list was that I've been thinking about this list for a long time, and it probably predates the time that I was as aware as I am now on those issues. Um, it clearly is an issue that I suspect many people in this room would put on the list, and it might be one that um, that I need to change. The, the other people are always surprised that food and water isn't one of my top three, and it's just sort of the same thing. You can only have so many so many choices. Thanks. So sometimes, if students are unwilling to ask questions, I, I start asking them questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wyckoff, for that uh, really stimulating and, and beautifully uh, delivered uh, presentation. I, I'm Doug Heimberger from the yeah. uh, Institute for Global Health here at Vanderbilt. And just sort of thinking uh, aloud among the, uh, one of the things I think that makes it really difficult for people to prioritize lists uh, uh, like this is that some of these that you listed are could be considered root causes, and others are, are manifestations. And so, to some degree, we're you know it, it, I think we're all thinking through in our minds what, why why did I choose a given yeah. one? And uh, and if I shifted, I guess from the from the first round to the second round, uh, I might have moved more toward root causes. And um, um, and it seems that the ones that you chose are are more in the in the root cause yeah. rather than. Uh, is that is that part of the yeah? I mean, that's actually a for, very yeah. thoughtful comment. I yeah, I, I look at food and water, and I am worried about it from a standpoint of environmental destruction and overpopulation. But you're right; it's it, it is the outcome. So the question I usually ask is, right, what of what I said, what do you disagree with? And that's that's usually a good way to get people to start commenting. Please. Um, I also want to thank you for the, for a fascinating presentation. My name is Barbara Clinton. I'm from the Center for Community Health Solutions at Vanderbilt. Um, and I, maybe this is a, a change a little bit in the focus, but um, are there one or two things that as you look at developments in global health, you see as particularly promising for dealing with the number, your number one, two, or three? The thing I think is most promising, just this is a very parochial thing to say, but the enthusiasm of young Americans to care about global health I think is the most encouraging thing that I've seen. I think we've gone through an era of time when we've all wondered why our youth were not more actively involved in the political process. And I think their involvement and interest in global health is a reflection, I hope, of something that from our, again, this is just from the U.S. perspective. The other thing that may sound a little odd is, the other, the other thing I think is, is, is evolving is the realization that it is the host country and the host people who must drive these changes. We can't come in from abroad and just dictate what happens. Those two changing perceptions, I think, are the things I find most optimistic. But I'd open that up to others to, to think about. Okay, well, thank you very much, and, oh, yes, please. Darn, I'm going to get away with that. Hi. I want to thank you for your brilliant presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Vincent Agboto. I'm the director of biostatistics at Meher Medical College, and I'm an assistant professor here. Uh, I'm an adjunct assistant professor here at Vanderbilt University. Um, regarding your top three list, uh, the number one list, how do you try to address that without, you know, making it a, I would say, political football yeah. when you talk about, you know, inequality of resources, you know, it could be. Yeah. Um, usually when I'm talking to students, I tell them there's really only two things they can do. They can either act, that is, get a skill and take it to people who need it, or they can advocate. I think, I think there's nothing wrong with us saying 
we don't believe that this is an acceptable situation. And the more people who say that, I think the more likely it is that people will understand that and start to say, you know what, we can make sure that people aren't dying from lack of access. There will always be people that die. We, we believe that's almost universal. Uh, but I think if we can change the public's opinion about these issues and say, this is not a political, I'm, I'm not a political person, I'm really not. To me, this is just something that's fundamentally wrong and it's something we can address. And I think if we all take that message out, I think it can make a difference. Especially, you know, again, it's, it's this idea of focusing on young students, people that are going to be leaders in 20 years, get them to start thinking this way so that they can perhaps rectify some of the mistakes that we either made or grew up with. Great. Well, I'll see some of you at the breakout session later on, uh, but thank you for your attention.